So, um, so that's all good, all to the good. Anybody, any other comments they'd like to raise with regards to David's update? No, in that case, can, no, in that case, can I thank David for coming along tonight and for giving us the update that he has. Um, it is a uh, it is appreciated, and uh, again, just a bit of a thanks to Jerry for reminding us about us keeping the uh, keeping this to the front of our minds. Although, as David said, there will be a bit of a, a lull now for those 12 months. But it is important in that period that groups that can uh, misrepresent the fact that there's a technical piece of work going on that is part of the process which will feed the wider democratic process as this comes, thing comes through. Uh, isn't misrepresented uh, in those terms, though nothing's going on, because clearly it is. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, I'm going to move on, because we're doing very well on time this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this evening. Uh, and what I've got here now is community question time, a bit that we all really enjoy. Uh, and so uh, we've got this for about an hour. Um, so let's Let's make a start. And the gentleman at the front. Yes. May I use your microphone, yes. please? <laughs> oh, there is one over there, actually. That's okay. Yeah. Carry on. But yeah, let's, <laughs> let, let's do it that way because that one can keep going around. There. That one needs to be off. There we are. Can you switch yours off, Phil? Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm with this group of people here from Heron Road in Mells, which Jerry quite rightly mentioned a moment or two ago. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Heron Road, it's a country lane. Um, we lived in Heron Road for 40 years now, and as I say, it's a country lane with major road traffic. We have speeds in excess of 60 mile an hour on a regular basis up and down our road. We have um, heavy goods vehicles passing at 5.30 in the morning, and our beds are shaking, um, it's a dreadful situation. Um, we have had meetings recently, several meetings with Margaret Greenwood, um, and she has decided to go for um, LEP funding, which is due, I think, in, unless I'm, yes, in July, because obviously these budgets that you kind folk are talking about aren't going to no. sort out Heron Road. But in the meantime, um, to try and alleviate problems, uh, Jane was saying that you have a small budget left over in the highways budget. Uh, road safety. Road safety, road safety yeah. yes. Well, <coughs> could I possibly ask you to consider putting um, a no entry sign at the Hoylake end of Heron Road because we have a small roundabout there. And on a daily basis, <laughs> people are coming on the wrong side of the roundabout. There are near accidents every day. It's a dreadful situation. So that's a no entry sign at the Hoylake end of Heron Road. At the other end of Heron Road, if we could possibly have um, a weight restriction sign, that would... At both ends. Yes, well, possibly at both <laughs> ends, to um, alleviate that problem. Well, I, um, okay, what, what we will do is we'll make a note of those yeah, requests um, and we will feed that into the process. I know, uh, I know uh, from my own um, experience that um, the three, particularly the three Hoyle H Ward councillors have been, have been consistently active in trying to alleviate the issues around uh, Heron Road and Pump Lane, as I used to call it, uh, in terms of, um, of, of doing that. We've got the, uh, we've got a note of those. Just to just to set expectations, okay? Um, we're making a note. I can remember when we tried to do a weight restriction in, I think Barnston, it was long here, wasn't it? Barnston Road. It's there. Yeah, yeah. It is, a, it is a very difficult and legalistic process. It also funnels the traffic down the other road, so Pensy Road gets hammered by our So, but what we will do, we will certainly <laughs> feed that into the process to see what can be done. On one final note, can I just add that there are plans in place to straighten out Heron Road. These plans have been in place for 40 years now. They might need to stop and change it. And the funding has been 
diverted elsewhere. So, um, if we could bear that in mind. Okay, we, we've got a note to that. Thank you very much. That's very good. Uh, I'm going to go to John and then I'll come across. John. Uh, yes. uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. John Hutchinson. Uh, two remarks that were made by the uh, uh, committee members. Uh, one was um, Councillor Ellis said uh, very briefly in passing about a new rail crossing. That's new to us all. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. And Mrs. Hall said something about uh, diverting the uh, heavy goods vehicles away from Hoy Lake. Well, of course, the only place they can go is into the other wards to which yourself referred to, Chairman. Okay. Um, I mean, they're, they're very good points, but I think, as, I think as you've heard a number of colleagues say, particularly on planning, and you also heard David say, that there would be, that technical work would go on, and then we would see these plans coming back, and then we need to take that, that view about whether the opportunity is uh, is worth any of the changes that may or may not have to be made. So we need to take that view when we see what the actual plans are. I did promise I was going to go yes, across. Yes, no, what I meant though was could we have some clarification on this new rail crossing? That's what I meant. No, I, I must, might have been a slip of the tongue there, David. I meant there's a new exit from the in order to avoid the I, I do beg your pardon, Councillor no, I, I misunderstood. Okay. I uh, don't worry, we consistently, um, I do anyway, I can't remember anyone's name from the start, so I'm always likely to misspeak. So, okay. Uh, the lady at the front there, I promise. I'm Susan Brown. Um, I assume that at Council you approved this new newsletter that's going to come out monthly? Um, I didn't. Yeah. So just to help you with the... It was supposed to come to you last Monday. No, right, right. Just, just to help, okay, because the, the council's processes are um, sometimes need a little bit of uh, explanation. My understanding of the current situation, there was a proposal that went to the Wirral's Cabinet, which is nine members at the moment, as I understand it, uh, members of the Labour group, who form a majority of the council and therefore have the right to form an administration. So they form a cabinet of nine. They have a whole range of powers uh, uh, given to them within, delegated to them within the council's constitution. A suggestion or a paper was written which the, uh, the cabinet approved to talk about these, I've described as we're all pravdas, but uh, community newsletters. So, uh, so that's, that's what's been agreed. Council now has to consider that recommendation, has the opportunity, if it so wishes, to call that decision in. And that's where, enough, if there are enough people on the council that don't necessarily agree with that proposal, uh, they have the opportunity to say, we don't agree with that, we would like it to be reconsidered. It will go to one of what the council has called, council calls a scrutiny committee. So. At the scrutiny committee, the committee will then have a look at it. It can, it can ignore the call in, say, well, very interesting, but we're going ahead with it anyway. Or it can um, uh, send it back to the cabinet, for the, to ask the cabinet to look again. So, I know that's a bit long-winded, uh, but what, what has happened thus far is nine people on the council, councillors, have approved this community newsletter go forward and they've done that on behalf of the current council's Labour administration. So there's a there's a whole I don't think, just looking around, because we're a bit stripped bare of cabinet members tonight, aren't we? Uh, I don't think there's anyone on this table thus far that's voted for uh, or against the uh, the particular issue. Well, I've spoken out about it in the paper with, saying without it's that we, we are still at a at a point where it's difficult for the creative community, like the Festival of First, yeah. to do any advertising. There's a brand new, beautiful website, which we can't access. How can we get our events on the Wirral website so that people outside the area who are visiting yeah. mm. will know what's going on? Yeah. We need our councillors to help us with this. Okay. Okay. Not the same. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, 
would that be would that be one for the officers? Because I was unaware of any ability of getting stuff on the website. If you want that would be taken down and someone should get back to you. If that's the problem with the website, it should be tackled, surely. We have tried the website people, we have tried the council officers, we have tried David Ball, we have okay. tried well, I, I don't I don't know if you want it towards your problem, but I'm more than happy to pursue that. Well, I don't, the more people are pursue it, the better. But yeah, we've got it noted down. I will say, all those many years ago, when I was uh, involved in running the county, uh, we did try and get, uh, to my view was, we should, lots of things that go on in Wirral, we should be celebrating and signposting from the council's website. I think mine at the time was, you know, might have been tied to, does everybody know in Wirral what goods and groceries are made in Wirral, so that people could take a choice when they're actually buying goods. Uh, and I have to say that the kind of IT, information security police, um, came in saying, oh, uh, well, it leaves the council open to legal challenge and so on and so forth, because you're seen to have been uh, advocating particular areas. I didn't agree with it then. I don't agree with it now. That's what, but what we've done is we made a note and we're going to have another go. But every council gets the Real Arts and Culture newsletter every month. And that should be put on the website. Okay. Well, we'll we've made a note. Yeah. Um, and Jane's reminding me, um, but I know you're particularly active on Twitter, but Jane's reminding me we, we also have a we have our own Twitter feed that we can use. Do you have a Twitter? Are you on? I would say this wrong. Are you on how Twitter? Many, there, how many creative people do you want? I mean, the creative community is huge. Yeah. You've got the festival first. You've got the Heswell Arts Festival, which is now becoming the Real Arts yes, Festival. Yeah. Society of Arts Members Exhibition, you've got the Williamson Art Gallery, who has fantastic exhibitions, and only because the Friends have put up a website of their own, does the Williamson get any publicity? We cannot get on the Wirral website. Well, I'll do that. So we'll take the general point back to um, our tourism team and see if there's, there's more we can do there. But certainly for Wirral West groups, events, uh, events, we've now got our own Twitter account, which Helen works very hard to promote what groups are doing, so we can you know, in terms of though, in terms of the use of social media, whatever we can do to support, we, we always will. I know Helen met with uh, the Heswell Festival recently to see how they could, she could support in terms of extending that across the world. So, please, you know, we are, we are, we, we can hopefully support you. Yeah, and, and what what we will do, what we will do, if that's okay, is we'll take because you don't want to wait for the next one of these meetings to find out what's going on. No, no. So we'll make sure we take your name and contact details. We'll. Uh, We'll look at that, and it sounds to me like it will be an all-party look at that, um, a cross-party look at that, and to see what can be done in terms of, uh, of what you've asked for, and if not, uh, why, and what can be done as an alternative. <coughs> it about it. There must be a, a way of signposting to calls to action, I think they're called, and all that on there. So there must be things you can do on the website that draws people uh, in or signpost them to it, other it's no sense having a good website and then not using it. No, absolutely. Um, any more questions? Yes. So. Um, I, I went to that and there were three matters that concern me. Um, one is the parking of vehicles on cracked verges. Two is the selling of cars on lay buyers in the constituency. And three is the um, advertising uh, of solicitors, advertising on fences. <coughs> I don't know in specific detail. I know there are things that people raise as irritations. I know in the past the council has tried to provide solutions in places where the grass verge issue was, was a significant one. Um, in terms of the sale of cars from how all I can do is say I can take it back. I know I know what you're talking about. But these issues have been going on. They have, yeah, years, and they have. Years, and they years. have. I know, and they move around from place to place. Um, I can see. I can. I know one area where cars were not advertised during the day, and yet there's about six of them. All I can do is, if you speak to me at the end and give me the specific locations, I'll take them back to the people who deal with these things. Okay. Take more road. That's where I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. And 
I think what we did do at one time is we we got these really horrible sticker things, don't we? Because there are again, because there are always legal ramifications around this. The police will tell you what you can and can't do and all that. So I think what we did was we got these really horrible, messy stickers, didn't we? That were placed on <coughs> placed on vehicles that were being left there for what everyone looked like was selling, but you couldn't. The police wouldn't uh, go along with so. So it made it really uncomfortable and unpleasant. So, I, but I will put my hand up that I have slightly, uh, sometimes personally a slightly different view. The thing that really annoys me the most, it's not necessarily parking on the grass, but it's parking on the pavement and blocking off the ability for elderly people, young mothers with prams or people in wheelchairs and so on. That's the thing that annoys me the most. I am a little more relaxed around parking on a verge as long as it's not getting, if it's allowing traffic to flow, as long as it's not, uh, as long as it's not blocking up the ability for people to walk along the path. So I have a, a the, the key thing for me, and here we are, pavements are for people, my ward colleague, uh, Councillor Watt, reminds me. Uh, so that's, to me, that's, that's more of an issue. more abandoned than a park. Well, no, but because people live in the house, it's just they're too lazy to, to put move it in the, the garage or to move the car. If it hasn't moved, it's been there for four well, we mean months. Well, it means it's abandoned. <laughs> right, go on. Jerry. Just a quick answer to one of your points, uh, one of the points you've just made. Just a quick answer to one of the points you've just made as regards to selling of cars on the highway. I've had recent dealings with the with our street scene people about this. Apparently it's not unlawful for an individual, a private individual, to sell a car on the highway. And you are entitled to, you can't stop people advertising. But it is unlawful for traders <coughs> to do it. And so what they can, when we report them, and we do frequently report them to council officers, they monitor them and check them. And if they find that it's the same person advertising more than once with more than one car, they tend to get in touch with them and tell them that they're breaking the law tell them not to do it. But the big problem is they're all using mobile phone number now and they uh, number which is not registered anywhere and so it is difficult. But our people are really all working on it, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Yes indeed. Wendy, you um trading and selling their cars on the highway, then as long as somebody can find that out, it means the car's not registered and DVLA come along and clamp it. And where there's a problem in Greasby, when DVLA came along and clamped a few, that did stop them for a week or two and I got quite optimistic, but it didn't last very long uh, because people are determined to do, and as has been said, what they are allowed to do, uh, park on the highway to sell their cars. We could discuss afterwards a possible solution around the cars parking on verges, but it leads to a lot of other problems. Okay, all right. So I think we've had a good round. Good question. Good question. Okay, and we picked that. We picked that up, and we'll make sure we come back to you. And lots of hands going on now. This is really good. Uh, at the back, it, uh, yeah, well, you, you had your hand up there, so. yeah. Phil I told you I could remember names. <laughs> um, my name's Phil Simpson. I'm on the committee of the ONA Golf Resort. You'll have to forgive me because my voice is going. Um, and I'd just like to, to make a couple of points as well as ask a question. The first one is um, the comments made that the, uh, most of the people in Hoy, in Hoy Lake agree with the Golf Resort. Well, we've had two public meetings. We've got a third one coming up next week, and that is not the result we're getting from them public meetings. The public meetings are saying they don't want the golf resort. Um, and I would like to ask the question, where are the Labour councillors? 
and where are some of the other councillors when these public meetings are going on? No one turns up. You've been invited, but you don't turn up. And they're your, your, they're your constituents. They're the people that you should be listening to when they've got a concern and you're not listening to them. And I, I would say this to anybody in this room that wants to come to those public meetings, come to the one next week, listen to what's said. It's totally opposite to what was said over there. And if the others want to sit on the fence, let them sit on the fence. When the planning permission gets up, which, incidentally, just happens to coincide with next year when uh, Lord Joe Anderson takes over as the mayor and he'll, he'll be the one that makes the final decision. That will be the end of your green belt land, you can be assured of that, because if this venture fails, that land will go to building. I want to know who or why don't these councils come to these public meetings. Um. Right, well, I, I like a bit of rumbustuousness in politics. Most people that know me know I, I like a bit of a, a little bit of rumble every now and again. It keeps uh, keeps things interesting. I, I just want to deal with a couple of points. Uh, again, you can have you are entitled to your view and draw the conclusions you draw from your experience. But please don't um, don't accuse uh, the community rep for the Hoylake area. Like in Mel's area on this committee, as um, as being somehow disingenuous in terms of her deeply held or her view and her experience. And let me repeat what I said at the outset. Okay, um, uh, Jackie Hall, Mrs. Hall, the work that uh, Jackie and her te team of people do in Hoylake, unpaid, not a penny for anyone in terms of other than raised by herself and her team. The work that she does for the community of Wirral and for somebody who is in touch with what the people of, of, of Hoylake are thinking, I can think of no one, well perhaps Jerry, that I would go to to speak to to find out what that position was. So please, don't, um, don't if, I would prefer if you didn't cast those particular aspersions. Make your comments freely and clearly based on your experience, but Try and do it without. Can I just come back? No, because I have no, no, because I have no. I, I, I don't listen, get paid I have, for what I do. I, I have, I have, I, but, I didn't but, interrupt you, and, and I would, is, I would like you to give me the manners for not interrupting me. Is that all right? So, so that's that one. That's the first one. The second thing I'd say, and again, you accused uh, council of single offence. I think again that was made particularly clear. I try to make it clear, the individuals themselves made it clear, that they have a quasi-judicial responsibility in terms of sitting on the planning committee to not prejudge a planning application, not to give the indication to a developer that they have prejudged a planning application, and that they must uh, take, the, uh, take the evidence as presented to them on the uh, in terms of the planning committee and the planning process, and they must deal with that on their merits and yeah, using their best judgment. Cool. Using their best judgment. And that was the point that was made by each member of the planning committee. And I would reiterate and, and support every one of them for making that point because it's a factual uh, position. Finally, why don't people go to your meetings? Well, I just wonder in terms of some of the things that have been said. I don't go to your meetings because I choose, I, I, I am, I'm either working somewhere else or don't have the time to get to those particular meetings. I always respond and give the reasons why not. I would leave it to others and you can raise it with, with them individually if you so wish. But it's clearly a decision for each member in terms of which meetings they go to, which meetings they can go to and which they can't. So, I think I gave you a good go, and I think we've given you a good response back. Um, the gentleman behind you indicated next. Hi, my name's David Bradington. Uh, there was no minutes read out at this meeting, or presented at this meeting, and no matters arising. So just for the record, I'd like to put through road repairs are still ongoing. But I do have a, a query about WICT Group, which is on the Wood Church. It's chaired by Tony Smith, or sorry, Councillor Tony Smith. Got some very grave concerns about the way it's been 
and at the moment I've actually asked them to get legal advice from the council. Apparently they did get legal advice but there was no written response. It was refused is what I was told. So I'd like to put it to this committee, can they investigate the constitution of this WICT because I believe it's been illegally broken. Um, the funding that they're allocating is probably being allocated the wrong way. Um, right, well, I think as all, all councillors and officers will have heard the, uh, the concern that you've raised, uh, I can see the assistant um, chief executive making a note. Um, can I ask on behalf, of, um, on behalf of all of us that you look into that for us, please, if you, you need to get a bit more detail on the, preci the precise issues, that I'm sure that will be forthcoming. And then if you can report back to us on what's been found, if that's okay. Yeah. And in terms of Hull Road, uh, Jane wants to talk about Hull Road now. Yeah, Dave, as you said, that was uh, in the minutes of the last meeting um, and it's been raised as an ongoing concern. concern. Um, I've got a really detailed briefing from Highways now as to the condition of roads on the entire Woodchurch estate, which I will share with all interested parties um, um, after this meeting. Um, but key points from that are that um, the concrete surface at the junction of Hull Road and Home Farm Road is in, is in poor condition and is going to be um, <coughs> programmed to be done this summer. So that's one major improvement. Um, and I know the issue's been around the middle section of Hull Road and um, this is showing signs of the, what they call cracking or reflective cracking um, not used before um, and as, as you've identified previously so that's only going to have a short life expectancy so we'll need to be programmed accordingly but I've got a really detailed paper though I think you'll be interested because it shows the conditions of the roads across the estate so I'll share that. Okay, lovely. Uh, that's super. <coughs> Any more questions? Uh, gentlemen at the front and then I'll, I'll come to you sir. Right, my name's Ken Roberts. I live on Heron Road. We moved into this part of the world in 1968, and there was a great planning move on to straighten the end of the Hoylake end of Heron Road up. Planning drawings were already produced, everything was produced. The road at that time, that's Heron Road, it was a country lane with about probably about an 18 foot carriageway. It's now almost 50 years since then. The road is still little more than an 18 foot carriageway in most of it. Okay, in places where it's been, the drainage was improved, the road was made a little bit wider. But now, as my friend here has said, we now have 40 ton articulated wagons going down that road. Not once in a week, frequently. We have boy racers on motorbikes, souped-up souped up saloon cars and the likes, driving down there, and I've timed them, I can't do it, I timed it with my camera, which is at four exposures per second. And these cars are covering 50 metres in these times, which are, it is absolutely lethal. I cycle a lot, and travelling down Heron Road on a bike, you need, well, quite often that you get forced into the hedge. A, the farmers don't cut the hedges in some places, the council cut them in some places, but the farmers whose responsibility it is don't. But forever we get fobbed off with this, either it's, oh, it's not important, it's the golf club. When the golf club starts, opens it up or doesn't open up, it's always given as a reason. The golf club has no effect on Heron Road whatsoever. There's no golf club there. It can only improve. We've got a situation now where this is the third, no, this will be the fourth attempt to straighten Heron Road. In 1968, when I moved down here, the whole planning situation was done. It was seen. There had been going to be a school in the, where the market garden is now. That was scrapped. The falling rolls were in the situation. Then in 1970, it, re, it was revived again. And again, the whole drawings were done, redone. We complained about it to the council, to the planners, and they came back with a tuppence scheme to widen the bloody road by 10 feet. What would that do? Would that slow the traffic down? No, just let me finish, please. Okay. That was in 1972. 
the recent one when the Sorrel Massey bypass was done, Heron Road was on there again. No, no, no action whatsoever. And apparently the money that was put aside for it went to build the roundabout by the uh, oh, Williston Crossroads. There's some crossroads, that's a wicked slur put around by Leslie Young. <laughs> I'm, I'm not bothered whether it's a slur or not, but we were, ed we were led to believe that that's where the money for the project had gone. Wherever it went doesn't really matter. What matters is that Heron Road didn't get any of it. And this is not now. As I say, picture yourself on a bike. It might be difficult for some of you. Why, oh, thank you. But thank you. it's all right. When you're as old as me, you will. I think I um, am. That's by the way. Can you imagine two 40-foot articulated wagons trying to pass on Heron Road? Or a 40-foot Arctic wagon trying to p pass a school bus on Heron Road? They were stuck there for about 10 minutes, shunting backwards and forwards. This is a lethal business. It's been a lethal business since 1968. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And the improvements made to the Swagel Massey Bypass have worsened the situation completely because we now have the whole of the Hoyrek traffic comes off the motorway down Heron Road. Or some of it obviously goes to West Kirby, but an awful lot of it comes down Heron Road. This morning, was it this morning or yesterday morning, I don't know, the, the traffic was stuck at the Hoylake Junction, at the Hoylake Road end, and th it was down past the 30 sign. I don't know, they would, okay, they were working on the bridge or something or something or other. And there was a reason. For it. But it was there. People have to get out of Heron Road and the houses around it, down Acres Road. Trying to get onto a from Acres Road onto Heron Road is another death defying feat. Because until you've got your bonnet onto the road, onto Heron Road, you can't see to the right for a start. Coming back in from, from Hoylake End, the same business again, <coughs> difficult to see coming out of, is it the Ridgeway? Yeah. Coming out of the Ridgeway, the same thing happens there. You, you, there are times you just can't move the car out. <coughs> Plus the fact when you want to park, we, we've all had to build parking spaces in our front gardens. Although we have garages at the back and they are used a lot. But we have to, we've had to provide parking areas on so that we can get our cars. Try and get your car off Heron Road, reversed onto your drive at five o'clock at night. Just impossible. Okay. I'll, I'll leave I'll it at that. I, but what, I'm, what I was really trying to say, if you just give me two minutes more, yeah. is the fact that this, we need that road restricting or we need lorries off that road, heavy goods vehicles and large lorries need not need to be stopped. They can do it down in Thurston, they can do it all over the place, they can't do it at Heron Road and they've been trying since 1968. Another five, another ten minutes and I'll be hoping that the hearse can get there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well thank you very much and that's very eloquent and, uh, and I think you, I think I'm sure the entire committee uh, empathises with the uh, with the issues that you face. We have um, made a note um, uh, that we will take away, and we will make sure we come back to to you with what the process needs to be and how that will be triggered, etc. Yes. Okay. Yes. Super. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, no. Sorry, Les me. Leslie. No. I indicated this gentleman here was next. I have seen you've got your hand up, so you'll go again. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Chris Holland. I live in Thingwall, a member of a voluntary body which does, we hope, some good work in the area. Um, my points are about the community fund. Obviously, it's a very beneficial fund and, and being taken up. But I am, I frankly, a bit disappointed to see that in the revision of the timetable, it now opens on the 28th of July and closes on the 8th of September which means that all the preparatory work, and there's a great deal of it, has to be done during August, when our voluntary body and a number of others that I'm aware of really is not 
functioning on all cylinders at that time of year. Really good point, so my first question is, could in fact that be reviewed for future years to see whether it can be made a bit more voluntary body friendly, as it were? Um, secondly, we were last year frankly appalled at the amount of detail that was required with the application. Eight pages of fairly close questions, including details about the original constitution and all the rest of it. And I would have thought that there was scope for well-established registered charities to be able to short-circuit some, some of that um, information requirement, which really is quite onerous. And my, my third question is, um, that if the council is serious um, about empowering local communities, is there not some prospect of actually increasing the community fund, recognising there's no new money, but if it is serious about moving services, cannot the departmental budgets be looked at to see what further scope there is to expand the community fund basis? Thank you, Chair. I, I, they are three sensational points, I think, uh, would be the way I'd describe that. That probably means I agree with them, doesn't it? So, uh, <laughs> no, no, really good point. So, uh, I, I wonder if there's something, given the, the point that's been made, we can introduce some flexibility around I think, the yeah, dates. I that's uh, only provisional and yeah. absolutely points. Well. And, and again, if we're going to sort of give it a bit more uh, notice that these things are changing, so you get into the cycle, pulling the bits together and so on and so forth. So, great, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you uh, would. Great point about the uh, application form. There must be a kind of pre-registered, you know, what, we, 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 uh, Councillor Rennie and I were really impressed with uh, Eric Robertson who we talked about in terms of adult care, this idea of tell your story once. So, you only have to tell your story, to the, the person you need to tell Story, it's his or her story wants to the, uh, the various organisations are going to interface with them uh, rather than have to tell everybody all the time. It, it just seems to me that that would be uh, not, not at that level, but the idea once you have told your story about your constitution and so on and so forth, <coughs> you shouldn't have to keep putting it in every time and so on and so forth. So there must be maybe something we can do around that. Uh, and uh, with regards to your point about localism, uh, of course, we're all in favour of devolution from Whitehall to the city region, um, and I'm sure the logic flows that you know with that um, devolution to the city region, then further devolution to the council and to constituencies and to communities makes absolute sense, and that's something I know uh, we as a constituency committee and me as a chairman have been pressing. Uh, our constituency manager to put forward the business case for that to demonstrate the benefits. But if I could also say, I, I'm, uh, I am encouraged uh, uh, that uh, one of our colleagues on this constituency committee, Matthew Patrick, is now the new cabinet member for uh, community engagement and uh, which constituency committee to come under. And certainly the early conversation that I've had with Matthew suggest that he, going from this constituency committee, can see what can work and what can work well. And I think he's keen to, to look at further opportunities for, um, for devolution. But, uh, you know, it's like everything. Um, you know, the council does, you know, let's be fair, Matthew's operating in an environment where money is tight, um, and we have to be very careful with every pound. My view just tends to be that, you know, the community knows how to spend that pound more wisely, maybe than someone sitting in the temple. So there is, I think, there is probably some sort of balance to be struck there. But I, I'm really encouraged that Matthew is showing such an interest in that. So, Phil, go on. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just a comment on balance. There's, um, I appreciate what you're saying about the forms being quite complicated. I've, I've tried to help a number of groups kind of negotiate them. But if we're going to simplify them for the larger charities, I just don't want it to be at to put the smaller fledgling groups at any disadvantage. We've got quite a number of them locally, and I know they struggle that form too. Um, the idea of them kind of people who've done before having their details registered is a fast track. If that's something that could happen, I don't see how that's a problem. But that that would be the way that I'd want it to be pursued. Yeah, yeah. Not two tiers of forms. Yeah. Yeah. It is 
Okay, if I just comment briefly on, on the first two points, I think um, the point about the timetable is, and we did talk about that, we, we know that that's going to be an issue, so we'll see what the flexibility is, but in terms of that, the detail and the having constitutions, Helen at the back, most of you know Helen, is the engagement officer, she works really, really hard to support groups when they're making their applications, so um, I think Councillor Brightwell, you're very right in terms of there needs to be a balance, because if it's a new group, we do need, we do need that information. Um, and, and partly because we want, you know, we can support them more in the future, but Helen is at the end of the phone, so it, it, it's not a case of we, we send out the application forms and people are left to it. That support is always there, so, um, and it's just so I would encourage not, not people not to be put off applying. Um, and we'll look at the form again because we do it every year to see if we can <coughs> take out and, and make um, more simple. Yeah, I, I, I'm not wanting to extend this thing particularly. Um, but I would say, um, and Helen, you already talked about all the other things that Helen does, which uh, add value and support the local community. Um, if we can find a way, um, the root cause is maybe the form is too complicated, rather than then having to have Helen available to help people yeah. fill it in. So I would rather it was easier for the form to fill in, rather than us have to have use valuable talented officers time in helping people fill in forms. Though we will always make sure we help and support people to fill in those forms. And absolutely Phil, I agree. There shouldn't be a two tier system because every you know every idea has merit, every innovation to me is interesting. I'm one of the and I like to see how they develop. But I think pre -reg pre registering you're a you are an organisation of good standing. We know what we need to know about you and so on and so forth. Um, that seems to, if we can take some of the onerous parts of the, the form out of the way, then that should be a good thing. Leslie, I promised you, because you keep spreading this calumny that, uh, that for some reason, not me personally, but the council, when I was in charge of it, took the money from there and spent it on first and some roundabout. Maybe I should uh, elucidate that a bit. That there was money in the budget for work on Heron Road. This was before the first Open Championship came to Mel's. And the council had not done its preparatory work properly. And the money could not be used on Heron Road, so was diverted to the Thurston Roundabout. The work that was required was to get a compulsory purchase order for the land. And this, it seems to be perfectly obvious to anyone with just a few brain cells that if somebody won't sell you the land, then you have to put a compulsory purchase order on it. And we are talking about 10 years after the initial plans were done. So the compulsory purchase order should have been well in place by then. And that's really what I find distressing about the slowness of this council. And could I just confirm what um, Ken said earlier? Um, oh, and what Barry said to me is there have been seven road accidents on Heron Road since the start of this year. This is something which is totally intolerable. But yesterday, um, Ken made a slightly black humour joke about uh, hearses going down Heron Road. I was conducting a funeral yesterday in Hoylake. I had to go from Heron Road to Hoylake. The funeral directors had to go from near Heron Road to Hoylick. What then happened was that the funeral procession from Hoylick went to Landican via Irby Cross, uh, Thurston Crossroads because that was the only safe way that they could get without being delayed by the traffic. So the funeral went, took an extra 10 minutes journey to get to Landican and that meant that the funeral service was shorter. This is something which cannot...